So it's time to introduce our next speaker, PTK Gregerson. He obtained a bachelor degree from John Hopkins University in Baltimore in 1972, and then graduated four years later in 1976 as an MD from Columbia University. He had made a two years residency, and then he took a time out as a musician playing the classical guitar. And uh, I'm telling you this because uh, I was told by Pete at coffee this morning that despite his skills on the guitar, he could not succeed in having breakfast with another American guitar player who lives in the same hotel in Stockholm as, as he does, <laughs> by the name of Bruce Springsteen. Perhaps, perhaps next time. Uh, after the guitar timeout, Peter uh, came, as we have heard, to train as a rheumatology fellow, an aspirin pusher, as he puts it <laughs> himself, together with Robert Winchester at the Hospital for Joint Diseases, uh, affiliated with New York University. And as we heard, it was during this period that they conducted the studies that led to the concept of the shared epitope. And Pete later joined the North Shore Health System in the end of the 80s, I believe, uh, which uh, later developed uh, the Feinstein Institute of Medical Research, and that is situated in Manhasset, New York. And uh, Peter Gregerson is there, the professor of molecular medicine, and is the head of the Robert Boas Institute, or Center for Genomics and Human Genetics. Peter Gregerson has built up large registries and biorepositories for genetic research, and I made a series of contributions, not only on the shared epitope and on rheumatoid arthritis, but also in lupus and myasthenia gravis. His later studies and discoveries on genes and SNPs relating to autoimmune disease includes the funny acronyms uh, such as CSK, TNIP1, BLK, and most importantly, I think, PTPN22, which has a special relation to the type of RA defined by the shared epitope and reactions to citrullinated proteins. He has also studied the genetics of other interesting human traits related to cognition, such as synesthesia and absolute pitch, absolute gehör in Swedish. And if you want to know what synesthesia is, you should approach Peter in the lunch break. <laughs> and if you want to test your own pitch perception, you can, free of charge, download the special iPhone app that was developed by his team. It's called Pitch Match. <laughs> Peter Gregerson has received several awards previously, for example, the Klemper Medal from the New York Academy of Medicine and the American College of Rheumatology's Distinguished Basic Investigator Award. Uh, the title of his talk will be From HLA to the Human Genome, 30 Years of Chasing Genes for Rheumatoid Arthritis. Please speak. I have to say that uh, it was an incredible pleasure uh, to listen to that uh, talk by Bob Winchester, and I think that the students of Columbia University are enormously uh, privileged to have him as a teacher. Um, I'm also very grateful to the Crawford uh, Award uh, for bestowing it on our three of us. I think it it's really reflects the uh, ongoing interchange between the three of us, and yesterday was an unbelievable experience for me. Um, so I want to take off a little bit from where Bob uh, left us, uh, but I want to make three observations uh, that came out of uh, the study of HLA and rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, while we didn't do models, there was an existing model that had been published the previous, uh, previously and suggested that our shared epitope was actually down here, facing the cell membrane. And that made us think, well, there must be something on the cell surface that's interacting with this. And it really was uh, a revelation to see this uh, structure from Pam Bjorkman and Don Wiley in 1987, that actually this was nowhere near the cell membrane. It was out binding a peptide and being seen by T cells. And uh, the second lesson is, um, oh, how do I do this here? Oh. It's easy to get overexcited because in 1987 there was the International Histocompatibility Workshop in which a lot of these sequences and the, the uh, serology and that structure came together. And uh, Hugh McDevitt, who many of you may know, is a very famous uh, immunologist at Stanford and a wonderful scientist, 
made the following statement to the New York Times. We're within a gnat's hair of understanding everything we need to know about how the immune system reacts. <laughs> so that gives you a sense of the excitement that there was to be able to pull together these sequences with this new structure that seemed to reveal a new world of interpretation uh, of, of these observations. And the, the third observation is that we are not done yet, because this is a study that I had the privilege of working with uh, Shomo Rechaudhry and Paul DeBacker uh, just uh, a little over a year ago, published in Nature Genetics, in which we didn't use 24 people. <laughs> we used 5,000 people <laughs> to really get at the details of what this association is all about. And in fact, what's revealed is, yes, the shared epitope is extremely important, but there's actually an amino acid at the base of the cleft that is also extremely important. And I think that this kind of puts a nail in the coffin of some alternative interpretations of the shared epitope that really persisted for a long time, and that one of which was that the shared epitope itself could act as a peptide that would be presented to the immune system. And I think this strongly argues that it actually is the nature of the cleft itself presenting peptide. Another thing that came out of this work is that there are actually secondary signals at class 1 and HLA-B, also at the base of the cleft. A very interesting uh, observation since HLA-B is not typically associated with the production of autoantibodies. And also in DP, there's a similar uh, structural element. So we still have something to learn about the MHC and RA, uh, just about the structure itself. So uh, here we are back at the shared epitope in the late 80s. And uh, I began uh, shortly after that to think about doing larger uh, genetic studies, uh, as did many other people you know, working on autoimmunity. And I want to point out that it was 16 years between uh, the shared epitope and the next gene that came along. And I can tell you that the funders at the, HL, at the NIH were extremely disturbed by the time we got to 2000 and still didn't have another gene. <laughs> but finally, we came up with PADI4. That was actually in the Asian population. And PTPN22 was the first one in uh, our Caucasian population. And then a technological transformation occurred. We were able to suddenly not just look at candidate genes. We had sequencing, but it wasn't very uh, efficient. But once we had the genome and we were able to screen the genome widely with relatively inexpensive chips using genome-wide association, an explosion of new genes developed. And they can't all fit on this slide. Uh, this is a most recent publication using a chip that was focused on autoimmune disorders. And this is a so-called uh, Manhattan plot, but I think Manhattan plot is no longer, it's more like a beanstalk plot because we've, we've now gotten sample sizes so large uh, that this, if on the y-axis is the level of statistical significance, has become very, very high. And HLA is way off the charts here. It's a p-value of 10 to the minus 150. Um, and PTPN22 is also 10 to the minus 100 or so. So we have a lot of genes. However, we're not done. Actually, if you look at the percent of the genetic variants, the predicted genetic variants that it's explained, it's really only uh, about less than 20%. And there are a couple of ways to interpret this. Uh, one is that we've overestimated the genetic component. And I think Lars will maybe make some statements along those lines. And the other is that there are actually a lot of other genes to be found. Uh, maybe thousands. A lot of these genes have extremely modest uh, relative risks, but are highly significant. So they're real. And uh, how many more there are, whether they're common, as these are, the variants are common, or whether they're rare, again, remains to be established. <clears throat> the other thing that's come out of the last uh, decade or so of work is that when you do this in other autoimmune diseases, you find a lot of the same genes but in different combinations. Uh, and there are some genes that seem to be specific to one or a few autoimmune diseases, and others that go across many, such as PTPN22. 
So how do we make sense of all these new genes for autoimmunity? Uh, one looks at these genes and says, well, what do we know about their function? And you can therefore, uh, as science advances, group genes by plausible functional uh, pathways or interaction networks. A beautiful example is a lupus, where there's a lot of genes in the interferon pathway. And in fact, uh, they have an interferon signature. And so there's some rationale for these genes. For RA, if you do these kinds of analyses and try to create networks and look at cell pathways, the CD4 T cell is very highly implicated. The little blue uh, genes in these intracellular signaling pathways have been associated with RA. And also, the cell that's doing the presenting of antigen on the MHC also has genes uh, that map uh, to rheumatoid arthritis uh, risk alleles. But the limitation, of course, is the state of the scientific literature is changing, and our knowledge about the function of genes is incomplete. So there are a couple of other approaches that have been taken, uh, mainly by uh, Shomo Reshoudry in several beautiful papers in the last few years, in which he's grouped genes by uh, not what we think we know, but by what tissues or cell types these genes are particularly expressed in. Um, this has a limitation, of course, because genes have pleiotropic effects. So some, not all of the relevant ones may be specific to a tissue, but it's a good approach. And the other approach is to look at epigenetic marks uh, that go along with these genes. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So this is uh, Shomo's paper from a couple of years ago, where he looked at the, the expression pattern across different tissues in different autoimmune disorders. And uh, you probably can't interpret these uh, labels, but in lupus, it was really B cells and early B cells that seemed to be concentrated for genes that had been mapped as associated with lupus. For inflammatory bowel disease, it seemed to be dendritic cells. And for RA, nicely, it seemed to be CD4 cells, which actually fit with uh, the maps that we had, were thinking about. So if you look overall at genome-wide association studies, and this is already a couple of years old, when there were uh, nearly 4,000 GWAS, there are many more uh, done now. But the overall pattern of what these hits are telling us is very similar. Only 7% of these changes are in the coding regions of genes. Now, genes make up about 3% of the genome. So there is an enrichment for amino acid substitutions in these hits. But most of the hits are not in coding regions. Some of them uh, are really in gene deserts. Uh, and many of them are in what's been, become known as DNA's hypersensitive sites, uh, which are regions of the genome which are presumably actively involved in gene transcription, or at least poised to be uh, actively involved. Um, and the important thing about epigenetic marks and DNA's hypersensitive sites is there are, I mean, the numbers that exist across the genome as a whole vary, but they're probably somewhere between 10, 10 to 20 percent of the genome has a hypersensitive site in some cell. But within a particular cell, it's less than 1 percent of the genome has a DNA's hypersensitive site. And these marks, uh, so are very specific for particular tissues and tissue types. And therefore, they can give you a guide uh, to identify what, where are the causative variants in these genes and what are the genes. So this is, as I'm sure many of you know, there's been an international effort to map these kinds of epigenetic marks across the genome. Uh, and there's another uh, uh, effort at the NIH to do this. This is just an example from there's a series of papers that came out uh, last fall. Uh, and this is just one example of uh, genes associated with MS and inflammatory bowel disease that mapped to a gene desert between genes. There was no gene in this area. But if you look at, you match up these hits with where the DNA hypersensitive sites, you get a sense that these are probably the ones you want to think about in terms of function, because they're sitting over a DNA hypersensitive site. So, the genome, uh, for those of you that don't think about the genome, the genome is actually one meter long, uh, and it's packed within a nucleus. It's only a couple of microns in diameter. It consists of 3.2 billion uh, base pairs. And so you obviously have a packing problem. It's as if you were 
trying to fit a 1,000 kilometer long thread into a nine foot diameter ball. It looks, thinking about doing that, it's a mess. So it has to be organized in some way. And it is, indeed is packaged uh, to become 10,000 fold shorter than the one meter. And the first level of packaging is to uh, kind of take a beads on a string approach where two, two twists of the DNA are wrapped around uh, some proteins called histones. And those histones have little uh, uh, tags that are sticking out uh, of, of, the, of the nucleosome. And those little tags are actually modified in various ways uh, enzymatically. And that ends up creating a code that tells you this portion of the genome is open for business or is poised for business and other portions are not. So one can use this information, as Shomo has done, to actually match up the genome hits with the histone marks that might indicate genes that are in an active state. And so this is from a recent paper in Nature Genetics uh, where looking at where the histone mark is in, relevant to, relevant, in relative to the SNPs that have been associated with the disease, here's one that's right in a histone mark. Here is a small histone mark and it's quite far away. And in, this is a sort of intermediate case shown by a heat map. So if you look at a phenotype such as rheumatoid arthritis and look at the cell types that typically have these marks that uh, intersect with the GWAS hits, you can come up with an idea about what cell types are most prominently using these genes. And by permutation, you can look at the statistical significance of this. And uh, indeed, very satisfyingly, RA, again, it's CD4 cells and it's particularly T reg cells that are coming up as being a, a potential target to think about in terms of where these genes act. So we have over 50 genes now for rheumatoid arthritis. How do we figure out what they do? I think this has been our approach is to take advantage of the cell specific expression and epigenetic patterns to design functional experiments that are targeted to the likely cell where the gene is acting. To take advantage of functional in information from the mouse on uh, these disease associated genes, uh, as you may be aware, there's uh, been a yin and yang of, of, of thinking about how relevant the mouse really is. There are many mouse models for rheumatoid arthritis, but I think uh, what I hope I'm going to convince you is that when you actually get down to looking at how genes act, the mouse is extremely informative uh, about what's going on in humans. And the third part is to focus on endophenotypes, not the disease phenotype, which is very complex, but an endophenotype of the immune system that is a little more easier to deal with in terms of uh, gene mapping. So the traditional model to approaching uh, disease uh, is you have a phenotype or a disease, there's a genetic component which you explore by looking at patients with a disease and without the disease or in families, genes interact with environment in the past or currently. There is a chance and fate component to this, which we don't fully understand. And this is the traditional approach to mapping genes and understanding their function. And this is, I think, the approach that is likely to be more uh, fruitful, which is to think about mapping the endophenotypes. And the endophenotypes are going to themselves give you a clue about what's going on in the, in the disease, both in terms of developing diagnostics and therapeutics. Because we don't really know, for all of, most of these genes, whether if a gene is associated and it has an effect, should we increase the <laughs> amount of activity of the gene or should we decrease it, should we block it? So the idea here is again a kind of an immune rheostat that for any stimulus that the immune system uh, encounters, there is a response and there's a stimulus response curve which define, is defined uh, in large part by your inheritance and you have a set point for any given uh, stimulus response that's set by genes. And it turns out that a lot of these genes for autoimmunity have an influence on this set point. And of course, T cell receptor signaling uh, uh, mediated by seeing MHC class two goes through a lot of genes as I showed you before. Many of these genes in fact are associated with autoimmunity. And this is just one example of a set point for uh, response. So I really like to start with this paper from John Todd and <clears throat> Linda Wicker uh, 
who looked at a, a very specific, they actually explored phenotypes that might go along with the IL-2 receptor. <clears throat> and they used a, what they called a human bioresource of people who are normal subjects, so you're not confused by having active disease or being on drugs, and asked, what looks, what, is there something that relates the risk haplotypes to uh, IL-2 receptor? So there is a protective haplotype uh, that's common in the population, about 11% of controls. And they looked at a whole bunch of endophenotypes and found that actually the level of expression of CD25, the IL-2 et receptor itself, was dramatically elevated in people who carried this protective haplotype. And even though there's quite a bit of variability still in the population within an individual, it's highly stable over time. If you look at the same individual several times, the R squared is 0.99 here for the level of CD25 on the cell surface of a CD4 cell. So this is a genetic trait. And um, that has led to a model uh, that John Todd is now pursuing, even in terms of therapeutics, that you know, if you're protected, you're going to have a lot of IL-2 receptor, you're going to make a lot of IL-2, and Treg cells, which are implicated by the genetics, are absolutely dependent on IL-2. They don't make IL-2 themselves. So the model would be that risk uh, is in part due to relative IL-2 deficiency. So it gives you a biomarker uh, for a risk and a phenotype, and it gives you a pathway to perhaps change that phenotype. So I'm going to tell you three stories um, about three different genes uh, that we pursued using this idea of endophenotypes. The first is uh, CSARC tyrosine kinase, uh, which is associated with several autoimmune diseases, not RA, interestingly. BLK, which associates with a uh, RA and lupus, and BLIMP1, which is also associated with lupus, RA, and ulcerative colitis. Oh, I should say that John Todd um, used a bioresource. We have also created a bioresource of 5,000 subjects that we can call in on the basis of the genotype type with this immunochip. I understand that Lars Ronblom here in, in Sweden has also created a similar resource. I think these resources are going to be absolutely critical for understanding the function of these genes. To be able to study them in human beings who are not sick and not taking a drug. So um, this is work of uh, Natalie Manjarez Orduño, a postdoc in my lab. Uh, and basically, we reason one of the reasons we got interested in CSK is because it actually binds directly to PTPN22, a major risk allele for autoimmunity. And the function of these two, two uh, molecules is to turn off SARC kinase signaling. Uh, here, PTPN22 removes an activating tyrosine at 397, and CSK actually phosphorylates an inhibitory phosphate uh, tyrosine at 508. So this molecule is turned off. And in T cells, uh, the SARC kinase involved is LCK, and in B cells, there's LIN, FIN, and BLK. So great candidate gene just to start off with. But really, the reason I started working on this is because Betty Diamond moved to the Feinstein Institute five years ago and had been working for the last decade or so on uh, this phenomenon, where she immunized mice with a peptide mimetope of DNA and found that valve C mice make a nice response and make anti-DNA antibodies to that peptide mimetope, whereas DBA mice make no response whatsoever. So she took the classic approach of recombinant uh, inbred strains and backcrossed and backcrossed to this phenotype finally mapped it to CSK. And in fact, the change in valve C versus DBA is a deletion uh, reconstituting an OCT1 binding site. And that results in higher expression of CSK in the mice that make these antibodies. And there's additional evidence that that is a result of uh, a defect in B cell selection. It doesn't get a signal because of the negative effect of CSK. So, uh, Betty came to me and I said, well, let's look, at the, let's look at the GWAS data. And this was the GWAS data for CSK. Odds ratio of 1.2, p-value of 
For those of you that don't know, no geneticist thinks anything's interesting unless the p-value is less than 10 to the minus 6 at least, and not at all convincing unless it's 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the minus 9. So this is nothing. But the candidate gene was so compelling that we decided to re resequence CSK. This is the major haplotypes that were present uh, in the population from that GWAS study. And so we resequenced a big gene. And this is still three, three years ago or so, so we didn't have next-gen sequencing going. So we sequenced only those portions of the major intron, where this regulatory thing was in the mouse, that were highly uh, homologous uh, to mouse. We also uh, sequenced all the exons. And we found one SNP <laughs> that split this putative risk haplotype at a p of 0.02 into two roughly equally frequent haplotypes. And this new risk haplotype was uh, present uh, in, in this intron where, in fact, if you go into the ENCODE data and the epi, uh, roadmap data, there is a lot of histone marks. So it was a compelling place where there might be regulation. And uh, after gathering 3,000 uh, cases of at lupus through friends around the world, including Tim Weiss here in the UK, uh, in, in the UK uh, the, um, this one SNP showed a significant association on the background of this risk haplotype. If you con uh, condition on this SNP, everything goes away. If you condition on the background B haplotype, the SNP association stays. So we said, well, where is CSK expressed? It turns out that CSK is much more highly expressed in early B cells and transitional B cells, which I'll tell you a bit in a bit in a moment. And uh, this phenotype, this genotype, actually was associated with a subtly higher rate of expression of, of CSK uh, in naive B cells. So again, CSK more highly expressed, you would expect that there might be more phosphorylation of this inhibitory tyrosine. So again, we went into this human biobank and asked whether the level of phosphorylation of LIN, which is the, phosphor is the target in B cells, or one of them, was higher in people who had more CSK. And indeed, there's a very significant difference in the level of phosphorylation here. Now, it turns out that LIN in B cells uh, actually tends to have a negative regulatory effect on B cell uh, function. If you knock out LIN, you get an autoimmune phenotype that's somewhat reminiscent of lupus. So we expected that B cells might be actually hyper-responsive <laughs> due to this. And indeed, you can see that calcium mobilization in, in, in response to immunoglobulin cross-linking is indeed enhanced in people who just carry this high-expressing CSK haplotype. So these, again, are where CSK is most expressed when B cells are moving from the bone marrow and developing and maturing. They go through a transition where they get selected. And as Bob suggested for T cells, when B cells are born, they also tend to be very autoreactive. And then they get educated and deleted. Or they switch their receptor around during this period of transition where CSK is highly expressed. And then they get out into the periphery to make antibodies or other types of B cells. So we asked whether these transitional B cells could be altered by this uh, allele. And in fact, what we found is consistent with the removal of a negative uh, signal, there were more transitional B cells in people who carried the risk alleles. And in fact, late uh, transitional B cells uh, were particularly enriched. We've just, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I've become very fascinated with this epigenetics idea and collaborating with uh, uh, Shirley Liu at uh, Dana-Farber and Shomo uh, Rashoudry. We've sorted uh, transitional and naive B cells, isolated DNA, and done ChIP-seq for uh, the first one of the histone marks that we're going to look at. This is what those histone marks for this particular activating histone mark is for CD79, which is expressed in B cells. CD14, which is not expressed in B cells, no surprise, has no marks. And this is just my taking the data and putting it up on the genome browser around CSK. And what you can see is there are histone marks upstream in both naive and transitional B cells and downstream. But in the intra, right near this SNP, there are only activating histone marks in transitional cells. <laughs> so 
Uh, obviously, we want to do more, do DNA hypersensitivity, and see if we can isolate exactly this region where the SNP is. I'm presuming there's going to be something binding to that region. So CSK clearly influences BCR signaling, establishes a genetically regulated immune quantitative trait that itself may be associated with autoimmunity. And of course, there are lots of questions. Is the B cell repertoire affected by this? Betty and I are working on this now. Are these enhanced responses found later in B cell development? We don't know the answer to that. CSK is expressed in many cell types. There's a big variation in expression in monocytes and macrophages, which we have not explored yet. And of course, do other lupus genes uh, have effects on early B cell development among those listed here? So how are we doing on time? Good. Uh, so um, I want to move to the second example, which is B lymphocyte kinase associated with RA lupus. Again, here's the BLK gene from the genome browser. Here are histone marks. And in fact, the variant haplotypes map directly into these regulatory regions. And indeed, BLK is sort of a poster child for uh, cis regulation due uh, to uh, genetic variation. And so this is the expression of BLK in 53 lymphoblastoid cell lines that was published a number of years ago, showing that the risk allele is actually associated with much lower levels of BLK expression. But of course, this is lymphoblastoid cell lines. So they're not completely normal. And I've just shown you that you need to think about exactly what cell you're looking in. So uh, a postdoc in the lab, Kim, uh, well, let me just tell you, there hasn't been very much done on BLK because in 2000, BLK was knocked out from a mouse and there was no phenotype. <laughs> uh, they are unaltered in their immune phenotype. So this is not so uh, unusual for a knockout animal, but it certainly blunted people's enthusiasm to go after BLK as a risk gene. But we decided to look in individuals, Kim Simpendorfer, my postdoc, uh, we started looking in native B cells. And disappointingly, if you look at mature native B cells, you actually didn't see the cis effect at all. Uh, but if we went to cord blood, and we looked at naive and transitional cells, and we were hypersensitive to the idea of transitional cells because of the CSK story, there was a slight reduction. Interestingly, BLK, which is BL B lymphocyte kinase, is in fact also expressed in T cells. And in fact, in, particularly in gamma delta cells, there seems to be a more uh, prominent effect of this, these risk alleles on the levels of expression. Uh, we then said, well, well, let's look at the protein level. And that turned out to be a real challenge because there were no, this, all these uh, SARC kinases are highly homologous. And so all the existing uh, antibodies that we could find cross-reacted. We got the cloned proteins, uh, recombinant proteins. And if you uh, alleged BLK-specific antibody also reacted to LIN and LCK. But we finally found one uh, that was specific for BLK. And indeed, it is expressed in CD4 C cells, in JERCAT cell lines, as well as in B cell lines and peripheral blood B cells at an even higher level. Uh, Kim then took BLK, put GFP, a, 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 a fluorescent marker behind it, transfected cells, shows that you can increase the level of BLK and see it by intracellular staining, high, highly correlated with Western blot. And when you look at protein levels in naive and transitional B cells, it becomes much more obvious that there's an effect of this haplotype on expression. Uh, so there's probably several molecular mechanisms going on here in regulation. So, we spent a long time trying to find a phenotype. Was there a proliferative phenotype? Was there an apoptotic phenotype? Uh, CD79, a signaling molecule involved with immunoglobulin signaling, was alleged to be a target of BLK. We looked at phosphorylation of it and downstream uh, 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 molecules. Nothing. <laughs> Sandra Hayes has gone back to uh, BLK mice and looked in more detail at what their B cells are doing, and found that, in fact, there were a couple of very subtle phenotypes. This, in fact, uh, BLK is highly expressed in transitional B cells in mice. And in fact, marginal zone B cells, a subset of B cells which may be involved in producing autoantibodies, actually proliferate more when BLK is deleted. 
And they also have an increase in expression of CD86 that is dose dependent in terms of homozygous, heterozygous, or full wild type. So we said, well, let's look at CD86 levels. And this is, uh, I'll just skip to this. This is a, a couple of weeks old, this data, uh, uh, although it represents several months of work, uh, that in fact, B cells, when stimulated in culture with anti-IG, make more CD86 if they are a member, if they carry that BLK haplotype and they express more CD86 at the level of uh, immunofluorescence. So what this tells us is, I think this is really the first human data on a phenotype other than just expression of BLK that goes with uh, this risk haplotype and suggests that BLK really has a negative regulatory role, at least in some B cell subsets, and that reduced expression is a risk factor for autoimmunity, possibly through CD86 and enhancing T cell stimulatory capacity. There are a lot of other possibilities here, and we still haven't really explored what BLK is doing in gamma delta T cells. So the third story has to do with a, a molecule called BLIMP1. BLIMP1 is well known to many immunologists because it's essential for taking in late B cell development, B cells go, going from memory B cells uh, into plasma cells, and is a negative, it's a transcriptional repressor uh, and master regulator not only of B cells but also T cells and several other tissues. Again, the mouse, Betty Diamond, <laughs> had made a dendritic cell-specific knockout uh, of BLIMP1 that was specifically expressed in dendritic cells and got a uh, hyper-responsive phenotype. Uh, and uh, we have then extended this now to humans. I'm just going to give you a little bit of data. This is data of Sun Jung Kim in Betty's lab looking at these knockout dendritic cell-specific BLIMP1 knockouts. If you stimulate them with LPS, they make more TNF, they make more IL-6, uh, they make uh, uh, more LET7C. She looked at uh, microRNAs that we know now are regulating at uh, the translational level uh, many genes, and LET7C came up in a screen. LET7C indeed was elevated in the dendritic cells of these BLIMP1 knockout mice. And, uh, there's, uh, she put again GFP behind uh, uh, this siRNA and could knock down BLIMP1 in cells. And indeed, LET7C came up when you knock down BLIMP1, suggesting uh, a negative counter regulation of these two things. And the detailed data is in this, uh, in this paper, but the model is this that BLIMP1 counter regulate each other. So if you have high BLIMP1, you have low LET7C and vice versa. LET7C is known to regulate SOX1, which in turn negatively regulates jacked stat uh, pathways. So you would expect if you had low BLIMP1, you'd have high LET7C, low negative regulation of jacked stat through SOX1, and high IL-6 production. You would also expect to have uh, l higher expression of HLA because BLIMP1 negatively regulates a positive regulator of DR. And in fact, oh, and, and indeed, the markers uh, that have been associated with both SLE and ulcerative colitis are flanking, not in, the BLIMP1 gene. And if you take people who carry uh, these BLIMP1-associated alleles, you find that in dendritic cells, not monocytes, you have to differentiate these into dendritic cells, you then see an association with low BLIMP1 expression high LET7C expression. And if you stimulate these risk allele carriers, uh, dendritic cells with LPS, they have much higher production of, uh, of IL-6 than their controls. And uh, monocyte DCs also have higher amounts of HLA class 2. So here again is a quantitative trait that uh, plausibly relates to disease pathogenesis that comes out of experiments in the mice that looks at a specific endophenotype that requires normal humans to contribute their samples for us to really relate this to the human alleles. So it raises the question, if you remember Shoma Ray Chowdhury's mapping 
said that dendritic cells were particularly important for inflammatory bowel disease. And of course, this is associated with ulcerative colitis. So are there other autoimmunity risk genes in a, a, regulated in a disease-relevant way in dendritic cells? Do BLIMP1 polymorphisms act on other cell types? We haven't looked at that. There seems to be an estrogen dependence of this in mice. So that's a very interesting question to address in human lupus, which is predominantly in, in women. Um, and there is no ENCODE data on dendritic cells. Most of the ENCODE data is on cell lines or just general cell types. So we're very interested in asking the question about uh, epigenetic change in dendritic cells to see what other genes might be specifically active in those cells. So future progress in autoimmunity genetics, I think, will depend in part on going from GWAS with the plethora of known hits and looking at function in light of cell-specific regulatory marks. And that, those results, those functional results, can be incorporated into and drive discovery of disease-related endophenotypes. And those endophenotypes can serve as a new tool for functionally relevant biomarkers and hopefully uh, new therapies. So again, as Bob has emphasized, uh, you know, there's a, spe there's a time course for disease. Many people with these diseases get antibodies years beforehand. Are there, so I think maybe perhaps the most uh, uh, plausible place to intervene to modify these endoph endophenotypes is here, before people actually get disease, but when they've got some preclinical evidence of disease. And, but then once they get clinical disease, obviously the, these endophenotypes are likely to change, but may still allow us to subset patients in terms of their outcome and response. So we need to think about the rheostats, and we need to think longitudinally about the rheostats, uh, and map these endophenotypes with go with GWAS, and then put those endophenotypes into a co coherent description of why they lead to disease. So as has been discussed, this is not possible without a lot of collaboration. Uh, Betty Diamond has been a fantastic collaborator over the last five years. We share, or our labs are on the same floor, and we're constantly interacting. And I hope that's reflected in what I've told you about my postdocs, Natalie and Kim. Uh, Annette Lee and Marlena Kern, who are in the audience here, have been with me for, I will say, over a decade, but less than two decades, so I won't. <laughs> And they uh, keep me on the straight and narrow. And I think the wonderful thing, and that runs the genotyping facility and met, really basically takes care of the lab and makes things or sure, uh, sure that things are in order. And Marlena has really orchestrated all the collections starting from the NARAC. But more importantly, um, there is an incredible open communication. And I can come up with an idea. And they feel very free to tell me that it's a crazy idea. And I listen to them. And if I don't listen to them, I try to convince them that we should do it anyway. And so that, that, <laughs> that is an incredibly important part of success in this business, is to be able to hear the truth from people. <laughs> and uh, again, many people I've mentioned along the way. Robert Plange has been a major player uh, more recently in this work, uh, along with, of course, Lars. And of course, funding from many places, including the NIH. And the Feinstein Institute has been extremely supportive. And I want to mention Susan Claster and the family of Robert S. Boas, who have uh, endowed my uh, center and have been an incredible support and friend to me. Thank you very much.